Good afternoon and welcome to Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's program with guest speaker, Emmy Simmons. Thanks to Ms. Simmons and to everyone who has joined us online today. I'm Amna Heider and I'm a senior at the University of Iowa, double majoring in philosophy and international relations. And I'm also pursuing a human rights certificate. And my name is Madison Black. I'm a fourth year political science student here at the university. And I'm also in my first year of the Master of Public Affairs program. We're both graduating seniors and interns at ICFRC, and we are the co-hosts for today's program. ICFRC would like to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, sponsors, and partners for their support. The Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, Public Policy Center, and Center for Human Rights the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, and City Channel 4 for providing online access to all of ICFRC's programs along with the UI Library Archives. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and de dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. As we get started, we would like to cover some Zoom etiquette tips. Please keep your audio and video turned off for the duration of the presentation so you do not interrupt the speaker during her remarks. Following our speaker's presentation at about 12.40 p.m., we will have a 15-minute Q&A. You will be able to submit your questions via the chat function. And at that time, we invite you to turn on your video, but please keep your audio muted to avoid any background noise. Today, we are celebrating International Women's Day. This is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. In 1910, the Second International Conference of Working Women was held in Copenhagen. A woman named Clara Zetkin raised the idea of an International Women's Day. She proposed that every year, in every country, there should be a celebration on the same day, a Women's Day, to press for equality, better working conditions, and other issues. This conference of over 100 women from 17 countries, representing unions, socialist parties, working women's clubs, and including the first three women elected to the Finnish parliament, greeted Ms. Zetkin's suggestion with unanimous approval. Following that decision, International Women's Day was held for the first time in 1911 in Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland. The United Nations made this an official day in 1975, and now over 80 countries celebrate this day every year. International Women's Day marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity. Significant activity is witnessed worldwide as groups come together to honor women, celebrate women's achievements, and rally for women's equality. The UN theme for International Women's Day this year is Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow. Our program today fits well within this theme. Our expert speaker, Emmy Simmons, will talk about food, gender, and the challenges ahead. Emmy Simmons is an independent consultant on international development issues, the focus on food, agriculture, and Africa. She's currently a member of the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition, the Board of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, and the Board of DevWorks International. She serves as a non-resident senior advisor for food security programs at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She has previous, previously served on other boards and advisory groups, including as a co-chair of AGRI, an initiative that brought together a diverse group of interests to transform U.S. food and agricultural policy, and as a co-chair of the Roundtable on Science and Technology for Sustainability at the National Academies of Science. She completed a career of nearly 30 years with the U.S. Agency for International Development in 2005, having served since 2002 as the Assistant Administrator for Economic Growth, Agriculture, and Trade, a presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed position. Prior to joining USAID, she worked in the Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs in Monrovia, Liberia, and she taught and conducted research at Ahmadou Bello University in Zaria, Nigeria. 
She began her international career as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines from 1962 to 1964. She holds an MS degree in Agriculture Economics from Cornell University and a BA degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Very impressive. <laughs> Please join us in welcoming Ms. Emmy Simmons to ICFRC today. Thank you, Amna, and thank you, Madison, for that introduction. I must say I was going to thank you for the kind introduction, but then I realized that Madison had thanked about 20 times more people. So obviously this is an important community effort getting together the Iowa City Foreign Policy Council. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here on this particular day and this particular Women's History Month and International Women's Day. Um, today, of course, we last night I was watching the news and really struck by how history is being made again, as 2 million people have fled the country of Ukraine in the last, in the last week or so. And it's so striking that in fact, the people who are leaving are largely women and children and the men are going back. But last night I was actually encouraged to hear a, a very sad interview with a woman who had left her children in Poland because she had to get back because she was a key worker at the um, power plant in, um, in Kyiv. And she said, I have to work. I mean, I have to get back. She said, it's just awful. But it was that notion of women being responsible for getting their kids to safety and carrying out work that benefits society as a whole. So I think that that background of last night's news, newscast was in fact very important for me. But it's also important to remember it's not only Ukraine where women and women and children and families are under stress. Um, I got a bunch of uh, email newsletters, one called the New, New Humanitarian, which many of you may know, which on a daily basis kind of reminds us of the, what, what is called the wonderful term chronic emergencies, which are affecting food security and, and safety around the world. So um, this is a, a good time to think about food. It's a good time to link it to the issues of gender. And because of my involvement in the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems and a num number of other initiatives, it's really a good time to, to start thinking about the challenges ahead that all of us are going to have to solve. Um, I was, my own history, as uh, Amna kind of indicated, goes back a number of years. More than 50 years ago, I graduated from the Department of Agricultural Economics at Cornell University with a master's degree in agricultural economics. And as it turns out, I was either number two or number three, the, the second or the third woman to get a, an advanced degree in agricultural economics at that university. Uma Lele, who many of you may know, was the first. <laughs> And then there was another woman and, and me in the next, in the next class. I, I left after I got a master's degree because I wanted to get married, which I did. And my professor stopped talking to me for several years after that because he thought it was a shame that I was just doing something typical of women. So I tried to disprove him the rest of my life. It was also about 50 years ago, a little over 50 years ago, that my husband and I moved to Zaria, Nigeria. And I was a quote unquote following spouse because he had a job teaching at the Institute of Administration at Amadou Bella University. So I had to look around for a job. I think there are lots of following spouses who have to do this sort of thing. And at the Institute for Ag Research at Amadou Bella University, I located a group a foreign funded group by the Rockefeller Foundation called the Rural Economy Research Unit, which had been doing studies of farming and farming systems um, since the mid 60s. And I naturally went and said, wow, this is really exciting. Could I join you? I have some experience in agricultural economics. I specialized in analysis of consumption, food consumption and household budgets. And they looked at me and they said, but you're a woman. Everybody else was men. I said, look, we are in Northern Nigeria where women are still in Perda and they don't go outside of their houses except for very, very odd occasions. And none of you men have ever been inside of one of these houses to see how the farming output and the farming process success is reflected in terms of what people eat. 
So they hired me. I didn't get a great salary, but they hired me. And I had a wonderful time for almost five years working, doing village level research, working with the folks who were working on farming systems, studying what at the time I called women's occupations, which are now known as women's micro enterprises, and had a, a just wonderful deep experience in trying to understand what makes economic life, family life, and food kind of work for people. I had grown up in an agricultural household in Northern Wisconsin. I was really happy to get away. That's why I joined the Peace Corps. But now I have spent the rest of my career studying food and agriculture, which makes all of my relatives laugh. But anyway, that's just how life goes sometimes. So I want to talk about food, gender, and the challenges ahead, sort of building on the 50 years that I've spent sort of digging and, and surfing in this, in this region. So Madison, if you could just advance to the first slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Sorry, one second. Yeah. Um, it seems to be frozen. It doesn't want to move, oh my gosh. Right, that was it, go back one. Go back two, actually. It might be a bit slow. Sorry. So sorry about this. No, it's okay. I could keep talking the first one, but I really want to illustrate with the pictures. So <laughs> just if you can get back to two slides, mm -hmm. that would be great. Because the first slide, which you saw briefly, those of you who are watching saw briefly, has a baby with, with a spoon going to its mouth with food. And basically the point that I'm going to make in that slide is that food is the foundation of life. Um, children are uh, from, the, from the day they are born or actually the thousand days before they are born and after they're until they're almost two are completely dependent upon mothers and their families giving them food. Now go way, you're way at the end now, you're going way the other way. <laughs> there we go. And we often forget the, the, I mean, we know that in fact, mothers and kids are intimately related. Mothers bear the children and take largely the full responsibility for feeding them for the first six months. Breastfeeding being the, the recommended sort of uh, approach to having healthy children, but also developing weaning foods and cooking them, preparing them when children don't have teeth and can't even eat um, regular food that that mothers play an enormously important role in sort of ensuring that children are weaned onto appropriately um, nutritious food. It's often forgotten though that women play and mothers play an important role in helping children develop their food habits by the way they cook, the way they eat, the way they respond, the way they time food, the way that they provide treats like birthday cakes, this is all an important thing. We know that women are successful in this arena because of course the population in the last, the global population in the last hundred years has more than quadrupled from 2 billion to almost 8 billion today. And that means that in fact, women have re this responsibility that has been sort of carried out on a daily basis with all these children. I think for many people at universities and, and today, as we talk about climate change, the food and agriculture focus is a, is a focus that in fact, we think about more sort of more automatically, food and agriculture, it just goes together. And that means that most people in the agricultural arena, like my colleagues at the at Amadou Bella University in, in Zaria, focused on farming systems. It's all about farming. It's about production of food. It's about having enough food, a big enough pile of food to be food secure. And I, but I think with climate change, we're all beginning to look at that picture, the integration of, of water and soil and fossil fuel emissions. It's important to note that in fact, three quarters of all fresh water in the, in, in the globe is used for agriculture. 
one third of the entire surface of the world is used for agriculture. And today, this is the bad fact that we know, is that almost a third of all greenhouse gas emissions are associated with agriculture and the food system. So I think we have that sort of close in family look at the role that mothers play in bearing and raising children, but we also have, and we should mention it, the role of women in actually participating in that production process. Next slide, please. I hope this one is easier. <laughs> This is a slow side slideshow, okay. And that is what leads us to what I think many people think about when they talk about food and agriculture is putting food on the table. And I've heard many, many, many farmers in my agree years um, talking about the responsibility for feeding the world. And obviously the United States and Iowa have important roles in this regard. They do in fact feed the world through global trade. The um, U.S. is the top exporter in the world, the country that exports the most food and agricultural products. In, 20, in 2019, it was the top exporter. Every so often, um, another, other countries kind of jump in. With regard to the percentage of production that is actually exported from the U.S., it's really important to notice, note that a lot of production in the U.S., in fact, does feed the world. 50% of Iowa's production or US production goes overseas in the form of soybeans. 50% of, almost 50% of US production of wheat is exported. 20% of corn is exported. 20% of pork is exported. So in fact, the US and Iowa is a very important producer in the US do help to feed the world through global trade. Most food on the table though, the stuff that you see on your table every evening, the stuff that people in Kenya see on their tables every evening is actually produced and consumed within the country. Even though food imports are very important, in fact, much, much food is produced and consumed within a country. The folks at Cornell who've studied this think it's about 75% is actually produced in the country. So if there's a problem with production of corn, in Iowa, it's going to be felt by all consumers in the US, for example. Households are reliant on food purchases though. They don't grow their own food. This is the thing that many people still find hard to understand. There's, there's a story of subsistence agriculture. You produce on your farm what your family eats. You share it with your neighbors through a local food system. When I was young and growing up, we had our own pigs, we had our own chickens. We, slaughtered them, we canned them, we froze them, we went blueberry picking. But in fact, today, even in low and middle income countries, between 60 and 75% of food is actually purchased from, from the market, from a market. But there is now both a global agri-food industry, Nestle, Unilever, um, other Smithfield farms, that export and are very much part of the global agri-food industry, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Frito-Lay, but there is also a local agri-food industry which takes local chickens, local eggs, local milk and puts it into the market. And that is what makes the food on the table produced and consumed within the country as well as imported. I made the note here because this is a university related uh, organization, science, education, and technology have played an enormous role, an enormous role in transforming the food system, the agriculture and food systems that we today know over the last hundred years. World War II actually was a big pusher for this, um, this fact because it, it required the US to export food which was processed and self-stable. This was, pe people in my generation still remember the age of spam. But science, education, and technology have transformed by developing new crop varieties. We all know about the green revolution of the 60s and 70s and the role that um, um, Norman Borlaug played in sort of pushing or starting that revolution. 
now celebrated with the World Food Prize in Des Moines. The science and education and technology effort has also resulted in more food processing. The spam was just the beginning of this. We now have enormous volumes of highly processed foods um, available literally everywhere. A colleague of mine came back from a trek in Nepal with pictures of kids in very far away Nepal villages eating uh, potato chips out of bags. That was just stunning to me. He said, yes, they actually preferred them to biscuits, but there we go. The science education and technology transformation has also been, um, has also resulted in processing methods, is in production methods. So if you look at the kinds of tractors that were being used when I was growing up, my father was a, a case dealer for a while, uh, and you look at the kinds of tractors and processing and harvesting equipment and processing equipment that are available today, you see that within a 50 year, 60 year period, there has been an enormous transformation in terms of productivity, in terms of ease, in terms of labor use, and in terms of cost. In, in the low and middle income countries, science and education and technology have also made a difference. There has been a revolution in terms of using improved seeds and using more fertilizer. The mechanical revolution in low income countries is far behind, far behind in some cases. And the use of precision technology and irrigation, precision, precision irrigation with drip irrigation and so forth is just beginning to move into the low and middle income countries. So in fact, the science and education technology transformation, which we know is critical to productivity, towards sustainability, is in fact a, a technology which has been very unequal around the world. Could I see the next slide, please, Madison? But what this transformation has done is, is affected, quote unquote, what people call the value chain. In fact, food and agriculture have created jobs and economic growth from farm to fork. Farmers now are the base of production and the rest of the food and agriculture sector, but production is actually, farming, farming is actually employing only a very small share of actual popu working populations these days. In the US, I think the number that I see reg relatively frequently is there are less than, there are fewer than 2 million people who are actually producers. Um, people question that because sometimes the women in family farms have not been counted. And there are even less than, even fewer farms that are actually producing the majority of food that goes into the market. But production systems reflect rural de demographics and where populations are, are dense compared to the land area and where the production techniques and technologies that I just talked about are still very undeveloped and un, un, ex, unexplored. In fact, many, many more people work at the base of the, the food system pyramid and are engaged in, sorry, excuse me, in, in agriculture production. What is stunning is that in many low and middle income countries, in fact, we are finding with better surveys over the last, say, 20 years, that the, the land base in many countries is insufficient to actually support the population that is existing in, through agriculture. Ag productivity simply cannot generate the kinds of incomes that people need in order to stay on the farm and to have that be their primary focus. In most countries, especially in Africa, many, if not all, most of the, um, the young people in, in farming families actually spend a great deal of the year away from the farm and working at non-farm jobs. Farms, farming is still an important occupation, but it's not enough to generate the incomes that people need to live what they consider to be a modern life post-farm gate employment that is off the farm itself, but in the food system, employs many, many, many more people and creates much more value than the rural economy by itself. And obviously, to some extent, this reflects urban demographics. In Africa, urban growth has been at historically high rates um, in many, many countries. 
the, the area, the segment of post farm gate employment that even here in the United States we see is employing more people, creating more value is in food services, not in production, not even in, in food processing and manufacturing, but actually in retail food service, groceries, restaurants, the whole, the whole gamut. And I think that this is important to note. It turns out that one of the processing areas that is really important is one that's also important to Iowa. It's poultry and, and pork. Um, those are, they apparently are very labor intensive relative to other things, other areas of, of processing and, and, and production. And so the post farm gate employment in that area of food processing and manufacturing is actually quite high. But it's important to remember that as we talk about food systems rather than just as production, farm production systems that we include all of the, that, those people and all that value that they're creating post farm gate. International corporations are often vilified for sort of creating jobs, creating employment, KFC, McDonald's, everybody, Coca-Cola. Um, the international corporations, however, and the national policies that sort of go along with allow allowing international corporations to thrive really do structure food supply and demand, even when the markets are in fact also local and there are local corporations and local companies and local small and medium sized enterprises that are actually participating in food supply and generating and, and responding to food demand. So I think often when we talk about food systems as opposed to farming systems, we forget that in fact farming is just part of this larger, what we call food system or food and agriculture systems or agri-food systems. And that we have to take into account the fact that as economies develop, as economies grow, as the demand for jobs and youth for youth and women especially grows, that in fact there's a transformation of the role of farming and the possibilities and opportunities that, that exist in the larger food system. I just point out here two sort of catchwords. I just read the Yuval Harari book called 21 Lessons. And he talks about sort of infotech and biotech as kind of coming into reality and really sort of shaping the future that we're all going to see. And as I was reading that book, I kind of thought about what they were doing in terms of farms. And I, there's a lot of work going on, especially during the pandemic now with digitalization because people don't want to travel. They want more information. They need weather, they need weather data. They need to find out who's marketing what where. They need to find out what the, the cost of it is. They need to get money out of their banks and put money into their banks and seek credit. All of that is part of, I think, the infotech re revolution that we're going to, we already see in the United States, but that we're increasingly going to see in middle income countries and low income countries. People, it, people in Kenya have been using um, mobile money for almost 20 years now, more than in fact we, we do in the United States. And the issue of precision agriculture that is dominant in, in sort of US farming, farming thought right now is actually moving internationally because of the possibilities of, for example, drip irrigation. But you can't do those unless in fact you have the technology to sort of manage the inf information on soil moisture, on prices, on costs, on, on how, what to do next, on pest control. So that whole mechanization, digitalization, infotech revolution is going to not only create more jobs in another sector, a service sector that we haven't normally associated with the food system or with agriculture, and it's going to bring it into the foreground. Biotech is the other kind of trend that was, that was noted and something that we all do know about um, from sort of the talk about GMOs, Iowa being a hotbed of genetically modified organisms as soybeans and, and corn are very much in the United States produced as, as genetically modified. But biotech is actually a somewhat broader concept and has to do with our understanding of how, 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 the, how life works and uh, how biology actually responds to 
has has a different role to play um, than than we have when when I was a kid that we learned about in class. The idea of GMOs remains controversial. It, you know, introducing a gene from um, a, a third product in or another product into uh, corn or soybeans or wheat or whatever um, is controversial, and Europe has has led a, 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 a sort of point of view that has kept a lot of African countries from actually adopting GMOs. Although Nigeria, the Nigerian researchers developed their own genetically modified cowpea in order to address a very destructive pest of cowpeas. And it has been approved by the government of Nigeria as like one of the first biotech one of the first GMO products to be released in Nigeria, a locally generated, locally developed product. But as we look at a plant-based future, as we look at more pests and more diseases being associated with the warming temperatures of climate change, as we look at the need for greater sustainability and tolerance to drought, and tolerance to rain, and we look at the need for foods to be healthier, biofortified, um, healthier in terms of nutrient composition, especially as climate, as warming climates tend to um, reduce the amount of nutrients in certain staple products. It's the, the, the call right now is for healthier products to nurture the, the microbiomes that are in all of our stomachs and helping us to, to digest our food and use it for appropriate, for well-being and health. That whole sector of science, which previously was pretty much ignored, um, has now moved very much more into the forefront. And so we are looking at biotech, understanding biology, using biology, manipulating biology, in order to be able to have better outcomes from the food and agriculture industries that we, that we depend upon and which are part of creating jobs and economic growth. So Madison, the next slide, please. And so I just wanted to sort of go on and talk about a couple the big challenges. First challenge is, as I just mentioned, healthier diets. I mean, getting moms to feed, breastfeed exclusively for the six months has been a, a call forever from the nutrition community. But as we know, only about half of women globally actually feed their kids exclusively with breast milk for the first six months. So of course, corporations have stepped in to make a product which can serve as a substitute. But what are healthy diets, okay? You can't, if you don't have breastfeed, it's not available, you need something else. Availability is key. We all know about a bigger pile of food, a bigger pile of rice, a bigger pile of corn or wheat as being part of a foundation of healthy diets. But diets have to also be accessible, especially in an age, as I said before, where people actually get, put the food on the table by buying it somewhere. Even in Nigeria, even 50 years ago, even in households that were practicing purda and women did not go out, almost half of the, the food value consumed per day was purchased through some kind of market operation. And in fact, the SMEs that women were operating themselves, the micro enterprises, generally had to do with pr processing of food and, and selling it in the local village. Peanut oil was the, the big one that made money. There were a number of other um, uh, things that were produced in order to increase their accessibility, snack products and so forth, but um, were not perhaps quite as healthy. But we also think about healthier diets as providing a balance of nutrients, not just calories, not just vitamin C, not just vitamin A, but a whole range of, of micronutrients and protein and fat and energy, uh, calories. So it's that balance of nutrients that's getting, that's getting a, a little bit more scientific attention and certainly getting more attention in the education system. Affordability is key. Um, if you have to go to the market to purchase food, it very much depends upon how much money you have, what kind of a job you have, not only whether you can get to the market, but whether you can afford what's there. There's a whole literature coming out from the last two years of US consumption data 
which shows the changes in pr people's purchasing patterns that have been associated both with supplementary incomes that were provided as part of the pandemic response, as well as the negative effects that were experienced when people lost their jobs. Affordability is key. And desirability, this often has this kind of social science thing has often been ignored by the, the farming people. Well, people should want to eat whatever, whole wheat. And yet there's, there, everybody knows, I mean, all of you know that in fact, you're not gonna eat something you really hate. Brussels sprouts, I don't know. What was George Bush's? He didn't like Brussels sprouts, right? Personal choice is very important. And I think what we're beginning to understand more in, increasingly as people say, well, it's just those international corporations forcing people to eat Western food, KFC or whatever. But eating local food in many cases is culturally affirming and it makes you feel as though you're, you're belonging. But culturally affirming also when youth want to eat Western food because it shows that they're modern, that they are looking forward and that they can behave like an, a global person. I mean, there is this, I've had many of these conversations with 19 year olds who, you know, who really, really crave having KFC because it is, it's affirming to them as, as the generational uh, choice. Dietary practices today, however, are the top risk for the global bur in, for burden of disease. The global burden for, of, for disease is, is actually quite rapidly switching from hunger, based on hunger and undernutrition, to based on overnutrition and poor nutrition, that is poor consumption of micronutrients, an unbalanced diet, um, the cho personal choices that, that go towards sugar fat and, and uh, oil. Uh, what is it? No, sugar fat and whatever. Um, but it's dietary practices today are a top risk for disease. Greater than tobacco, greater than HIV AIDS, greater than high blood pressure. So if you look at the data that are coming from the Institute uh, for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IMHE data, you will be stunned. You will be stunned at their identification of how poor dietary practices are leading to this revolution or this, this wave of non-communicable diseases and death. Um, the picture on the bottom, of course, shows the obesity ob epidemic, which many people just refer to as overweight and obesity. But more than 40% of Americans are in fact obese. And that is a huge, huge risk for disease. Coronary disease, coronary disease some cancers, diabetes for sure. But the other point that has numbers that I wanna point out here, I'm trying to avoid too many stats, but anyway, 3 billion people today cannot afford the cheapest healthy diet available, accessible in their country. It's not affordable. It may be desirable, but it is definitely not affordable. Anna Herforth and a team of researchers have looked into this. They have published this within an FAO paper. And Anna has put another paper on the CSIS website, which is just, it's just crushing when you think that there are almost 8 billion people in the world and more than a third, no matter what kind of personal choices they make, no matter how carefully they, they budget their incomes, they cannot afford the cheapest healthy diet that covers their caloric needs, protein and fat, and vitamins and micronutrients. It just can't be done. So next slide, please. After that depressing slide. This is the second challenge. And this one is a challenge that I think everyone is aware of these days. And I understand there was a tornado in Iowa yesterday or the day before, which was a, a stunner. Um, but environmental stewardship and the fact that um, agriculture is such an important user of, the, of in natural resources. And there is such a tight link between what is produced, how it's produced, how it's processed, how it's, how it's um, transported, how it is wasted, either intentionally or just through rotting, um, that the issue of environmental stewardship is intrinsically linked 
to food and agriculture. Soil, water, forest, grazing lands, quality, quantity, with a growing population, if we grow another 2 billion people, will there be enough additional space for production of the products that we want to eat and that we should be eating? There's new attention. Everybody's been looking at soil, water, forest, and grazing lands for decades, but there is new attention in my view, and this is why it's a real challenge, to soil microorganisms, to pollinators, to pathogens. And I think that this sort of looking at the micro level has been aided by the development of analytical technologies, which 50 years ago, I guarantee did not exist. But it's also people's realization that even in a successful agricultural state like, like Iowa, um, production of the same products year after year after year after year does have an effect on on the, on the quality of the soil that's there. What we're seeing in Africa is that, that pathogens are moving with climate change. It gets warmer, the winds change, pathogens move from one country to the next country. We are also very much more aware that the true costs of food and agricultural use of natural resources have been wildly underestimated. There's an initiative called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, for those of you who are interested, it's called TEEB, which has been taking a, sort of a deep dive into this issue of what are the true costs. Farmers believe that rain is free, right? It comes, and then you get it. But on the other hand, management of rainfall, management of the pollution that can occur from rainfall, management of the downstream effects of pollution on, for example, fish populations or the way that the soil structure is, is, is affected downstream. All of those costs are now being actually put into a, a common valuation framework. And fun, we're, we're, we're so unaware of so many of these costs that it, this, is, this is a true challenge. It's a statistical challenge, it's an analytical challenge. And when we think about what should the farmer pay, what should consumers pay, what should, society as a whole pay, the taxpayer, quote unquote, pay, we are still a long way from solving this problem. In Iowa, of course, the issue of, of pollution has been a big issue for between farmers and um, urban water processing, water pr service delivery plants, because they have to manage that runoff of phosphates and nitrogen which goes into the water and then doesn't want to go back, it shouldn't be going back out to urban consumers. So that true cost issue, I think is an issue that is really an incredible challenge going forward. We do understand that climate change is not just weather. Farmers have understood weather for many, many years. All of us, I think, even if we weren't farming, pretty much understand that weather you know, is variable, it can be violent, it can be, it can be unexpected. But now that we are understanding that it's not just weather and it's not just random, but in fact, there are trends here from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's work. Now it's very much the, the agricultural community and the food community are very much switching to understanding that we need to adapt, yes, but we also need to mitigate the contributions of a third of greenhouse gases that emerge from the food and agriculture sector. The uneven distribution of people and natural resources is very much associated with this issue of environmental stewardship, because if you have too many people in a place that can no longer support them, and I, the, Northern Nigeria is actually a good example of this, it fuels conflict and it fuels migration. You see people leaving certain areas of countries because they have experienced drought for so many years that they really just, the people just believe they can't survive there and they leave. But where do they go? Where do they get the new jobs? Where do they get the new income? So we now have a new research agenda and then I'll stop talking um, in front of us. We have the issue of farming systems, which goes back you know, and this, my involvement, it goes back more than 50 years. How do people choose the crops that they choose? How do they put them together? How do they do horticultural crops and orchard crops and livestock and, and major grains at the same time? 
sustainable intensification, another very critical factor as growing populations are gonna put more pressure on land. Regenerative agriculture has become a new catchphrase, which you should watch out for. It's still relatively undefined in my view, but it does mean that we, we, we're looking forward. We need to be able to see how we're going to survive and sustain production and productivity for the future. And then I want to end on this. I hope you noticed that every single picture was about women, but we also need to talk about equity of opportunities for women in food and agriculture, because the situation is not equal. Uh, it's not equitable or equal. And yet women, as we go back to our first baby food picture, are, are so fundamentally involved in food and so fundamentally involved in sort of the nurturing of families and responsibility for ensuring sustainable access to food over time. So the issue of equity of opportunities for women and the equity of returns that women can realize is just fundamental and just eternal. And, and we we're a long way from solving that issue. Okay, last, last, last one. Last slide, and I realize that as often as I often do, I talk too much. So let me just sort of just tick point these as other pressing challenges ahead for food system transformation. People are beginning to agree following the U United Nations Food System Summit that was held last September um, and the COP26 meeting, which was held in Scotland talking about environmental issues and the nutrition for growth meeting that was held in Japan in these last December that we absolutely need to think and work together on transforming our food systems in many, in several different ways. And these are sort of the tick list of ways that come to my, to my mind. COVID highlighted new weaknesses and strengths in food systems. The fact that we didn't understand some markets, that markets, for example, in the US had evolved to be very sort of purchasers, purchase specific so that people were growing gourmet food for very small markets. And when those small markets crashed, those gourmet producers also crashed. But we have, for, we have the, a better understanding of markets in general, I think because of the COVID weaknesses that were highlighted. We have positive agreement from the UN Food System Summit on the goal of sustainable healthy diets for all. It used to be just ending hunger, but ending hunger is not enough. It's sustainable, healthy diets for all, for all going into the future. We have little agreement, however, even in spite of thousands of people participating in the Food System Summit, we have little agreement on how we're gonna reach that goal of sustainable, healthy diets for all. We know that it's multidisciplinary, it's multi-sectoral, it's multi-scale, it's multi-locational, and as many people have said to me as I've gone into this little spec, oh, it's too complicated. We can't deal with it. We don't have a choice. That's exactly how reality is. We need new policies. We need new technologies. The question that I'm going to raise for International Women's Day is, are they woman friendly? Because so many of the policies, so many of the technologies that have been introduced over the years have not been friendly to women. They've involved credit. Which, which women were not allowed to have. Where they've involved land and wise use of land, but women didn't have land tenure. They've involved education and science and women's education has been stunted. So I could go on and on, but I won't. The last point is that I believe, and this is my positive point, is that I think we have new and emerging spaces to explore and align. And it's the alignment which is key here. Science, business, community, and individual interests. And it's our challenge to figure out how that alignment will work. Because right now it's not working, right? Individual interests somewhat are served by businesses, but community interests may not be served by business interests and so forth. So with that, let me just sort of say thank you. Um, let's have some discussion. I, I'm sorry I talked too long, but... Uh, Anyhow, it's an exciting topic and it's, and it's challenging, I think, for all of us because we share in it because we eat every day. So, Madison, you want to put up the questions, the question sign, and then we'll have whoever is doing the chats will.
challenge me. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, we now move to the question and answer portion of our program. We have a, a bit uh, of time for some questions. Please submit your questions via the chat function at the bottom of the viewing screen. Uh, feel free to turn on your video function as well, but please keep it muted. Uh, while we're waiting for, for questions to come in, ICFRC wants to thank all of its members and donors for their support. If you'd like to join ICFRC or make a gift to support our programs, please go to icfrc.org. Thank you. Now we will be waiting for some questions to come in. Nobody had any questions. They're overwhelmed. <laughs> um, I have a question in the meantime, if that's okay with you. Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you for that presentation. And I think you covered a lot of ground in terms of where we're going environmentally and in terms of sustainability. Uh, I, I've come across a debate of like whether or not aid works when sending to you know impoverished countries. Um, I've come across that through my IR studies and through my human rights studies. I was wondering your thoughts on uh, on aid and whether or not aid in terms of, for example, providing food to food in secret countries, whether or not that's as effective in the times we live in right now, as opposed to um, other strategies. Okay, let me just let me just answer that because it's a nice broad question. Aid, since I worked for the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is often called U.S. Aid, um, has been my kind of framing for framework for thinking for many, many years. But aid is not just a thing. It's money, financial assistance. It's technical training. It's um, uh, immediate food aid, as you put it, you know, stuff that comes in out of a bag. But it's also engagement. It's engagement with community groups. It's engagement with, with farming. It's engagement with universities. And it's that, that relationship that goes under the broad title of aid, which I think we need to think about. Food aid in a bag of wheat or a bag of rice sent to starving populations, hungry populations, especially after a disaster is critical. People literally will die without it. So when you talk about actual food aid, I mean, the physical food aid, that's one thing. One of the things that we have found in long-term um, disaster situations, let's say Syria as the long-term disaster, is that food aid can be delivered in the form of money as well as in the form of actual product. And there are some advantages to delivering food aid in terms of money. A, it keeps the economy going. B, it allows people to make their own choice. C, it allows people to share in a way which is actually, which is actually helpful in terms of maintaining social links and network. So that kind of aid, I think, is fundamental in crisis situations. I think we'll see food aid going, for example, to Poland and the other countries where Ukrainians are are fleeing right now because they actually need food right now to cook, to eat, to have, to have in their hand. But as time goes on, it's going to be money, it's going to be recovery assistance, it's going to be technical assistance to rebuild bridges and, and roads and, and, and factories. Um, so that's another kind of aid. Um, and an aid as, as a form of education, support for education, actually, you know, University Exchanges, University of Iowa probably has foreign students, is also a critical sort of way of engaging, transferring knowledge, building knowledge, having that knowledge be relevant and having it be brought into action quite quickly. I'm a big proponent of aid. I think we spend, the U.S. spends too little, less than 1%, way less than 1% of our national budget on assistance to other countries. And I think with climate change coming along and the unpredictable effects that, are, that people are experiencing, we will be looking at a very unstable and unhealthy and unhappy future if we in fact don't maintain and improve our mechanisms for providing assistance and aid. We have another question here in the chat. Um, how and who can be held responsible for the externalities or true costs of our agricultural systems? 
Yeah, well, you can answer that question and then tell me because I don't know yet, okay? Um, it's very difficult. I think that there have been a number of initiatives, for example, to do what is called de-risking, um, effectively allowing public funds and private funds to work together to reduce the risks, for example, that a farmer would have in improving you know, stream runoff um, issues, right, or addressing stream runoff issues. Um, we all, to some extent, are responsible. I mean, you all know the numbers about uh, the amount of feed that has to go into producing animals, which then are eaten by people, but in which there's a, a great deal of cost involved in production of that food and a great deal of cost that is, or value that is lost by actually, by the time it transits through the animals. So that, I mean, people are, rec many people are recommending that we think about more plant, plant forward, I think is the expression, plant forward diets with less meat consumption, particularly less red meat consumption because it's associated with, with coronary heart disease and other issues. On the other hand, many people are saying that this is not blanket. This is not a blanket thing. This is part of the, this, the who's responsible. That in fact, many people, many consumers in low and middle income countries need to eat more meat and protein sources, eggs, milk. Um, and so what we've got to do is figure out you know, how people in high income countries and people in low income countries kind of share this share this future of, um, of the true cost of food. So I believe that the true cost of food right now is, it, it's an issue that, that to my mind is, is, is still at, in its early stages because we don't, you can't assign responsibility and you can't ex have people accepting that cost if they don't understand it. And I don't think we completely understand exactly what those costs are and how they can be alleviated. We do, there's a very big discussion going on about reducing waste and loss and, of food. And part of that has to do with more efficient transport. Part of it has to do with building more local food systems so that food doesn't move across such great distances as it moves now. That that would reduce the true cost of food because 30 to 40% particularly of horticultural products go to waste before they're actually, be, rather than being consumed. Um, so I don't know, I, that's a really good question. I wish I knew the answer and I wish I was more coherent about it, but it's working out how, that, how those costs are going to be shared is going to be a big challenge for us. It, I don't think the courts are gonna be at, up to it right now in terms of deciding who pays, for example, for water pollution from runoff or who pays for, uh, you all followed the, the, dis, the farmer's strike in, in India last year where farmers you know, said they needed to get more money and they really needed to burn their fields and cause, and cause air, air pollution in Delhi because that was how they, they were gonna make money on their fields. I mean, it's a big discussion, but I think we're still at the beginning of figuring out A, what the costs are, and then B, how we're going to share those costs in terms of moving forward for sustainable, healthy diets. Thank you so much, Emmy. It is now 1 p.m. It's unfortunately, we do have to conclude our program. Um, we do still see some questions in the chat. Perhaps um, uh, if you uh, all are able to email her, if you have any additional questions, that would be fantastic. Um, but thank you so much. We wanna give a big thank you to Ms. Simmons for her excellent presentation and for sharing her expertise with us today. Uh, Ms. Simmons, we are honored to virtually present you with IC4C's highly coveted mug for coffee, tea, hey. or the beverage of your choice. <laughs> we will coordinate delivery details with you very soon. Um, due to spring break next week, ICFRC's next program is on Wednesday, March 23rd at 12 p.m. noon. This program will focus on area refugees and immigrants in search of higher education. Thanks for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you.